Hello Team Kulak community. For this episode, we wanted to let you know that while we always offer these on both our video and audio only podcast editions, this episode does have a very strong visual component. So for this time only, we're going to recommend the YouTube version to help us follow along because there is a map component to it showing some key locations that are part of the discussion here. It's still a great discussion, so if the podcast is still your choice, you're going to get a lot of great information. But just wanted to let you know, this one, the video, does help you. We hope you enjoy the episode. All right, good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, we are happy to bring you another special episode of Down the Rabbit Hole on the Russia-Ukraine War. As you can see, we are back here in person around our, our strategic layout map uh, from the Operational War Game System, which... If you recall from a couple episodes ago, we kind of did an overview and mixed in what Wargaming can do in terms of being an educational training tool. I'm not going to go into that today, but we do have some updated positions that we're going to use as a reference. And it's especially important because the uh, what we're going to talk about has shifted to an area that has, up until now, not been terribly active, mm -hmm. um, which is why it has gotten the headlines lately. So as always, here with Dr. Yuval Weber, our Russia SME here through the Kulak Center at Marine Corps University. Uh, it's great to have be back in person and do one of yeah. these. And for those who can't see, we're we're excited because we're really pushing the bounds of our of our production values on this one. There are lots of cameras and wires, and uh, we're just hoping everything works here. But if it works out, it's going to be a really good discussion. So you've all welcome. And like I said, we're going to be talking about a place that has not received a huge amount of attention lately, just because there has not been much going on up until the last forty eight hours or so. Yes. Um, so if you want to kind of lay out for us. We'll, where we are right now, and then uh, and what we're going to be focusing on. So first of all, always a pleasure to uh, to see you, Ian. And I uh, just want to also give a shout out to uh, Mr. Tim Barrick, who was kind enough to not only lend us use of this gigantic map, but also to update the positions that we yeah. will uh, be referencing in just a minute. So I think it's great to start with uh, Crimea who, um, as we all know, you know, when we think about what is the big picture and we get to basically what's happened in the last couple of weeks and then into the last couple of days is to think about Crimea as one of the sources of real um, alienation between obviously Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, the backstory in Crimea, which is always something interesting to say, is that people always say uh, Crimea, you know, has long been part of Russia. You know, many Russian speakers are there. It just happened to be in uh, Ukraine because of, uh, you know, Nikita Khrushchev was basically a soft-hearted person. Right. And so the reason that Crimea was part of Ukraine, or at least the Ukrainian SSR, which led to 2014 and the Russians taking it, is actually a great machine politics sort of explanation. Hmm. So very long story short, um, for those who have seen uh, Death of Stalin, uh, they'll be and familiar. Right. And if you have not seen Death of Stalin, you can more or less just cut out a lot of these episodes by just going to that and then uh, reading the news. Um, but in Death of Stalin, we see that Nikita Khrushchev, played by Steve Buscemi, is a really sort of, he's a great schemer. He's a great politician. Um, and so when we go into that movie, we see that he is trying to outmaneuver one of his rivals, Beria, in order to become the next secretary general of the Communist Party. That's all well and good. The important part about why I mentioned this movie, why I mentioned the historical piece, is that Crimea itself was given to the Ukrainian SSR from the Russian SSR by Khrushchev because during the 1930s, he was the person from basically the Kremlin mm -hmm. who was sent to Ukraine in order to see the collectivization of Ukrainian agriculture. This is what caused the Holodomor, which yeah. is sort of the great starvation of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian peasants. So after that uh, episode was over, millions of people died, and he wants to become the leader of the Soviet uh, Communist Party. He needs support from the Ukrainians. Their little irk that uh, he oversaw the deaths of millions of their counterparts, of their countrymen, and he says, well, how about a backroom deal? If you support my candidacy, I will give you Crimea. So in that regard, they found a, an excuse, the 300th anniversary of Ukrainian-Russian friendship in order to transfer control of Crimea from one part of the USSR mm -hmm. to another. So this is all to say, what is the big significance of Crimea? Is that when in 2014, the Russians come in and they take it without too much violence, 
it has the sense, and this is, you know, I was living in Moscow at that time, mm-hmm. of a piece of the country that was returned. Yeah. That is, was never part of Ukraine, it was always Russia. And if, you know, Khrushchev wasn't so soft hearted or so corrupted, you know, we would have never lost it at that time. And I was there in Moscow when, um, when this actually like went down. And if you can imagine a, being in a city where like the sports team has just won the national championship or has just won Stanley Cup or World Series or whatever, mm-hmm. it's that sort of people drunk by 10 a.m. sort of energy. Um, so that happened, and that really sort of describes what is the bigger picture of Crimea's significance. In 2014, it was the big victory of Putin. It was the thing that is not like Crimea is the Jerusalem of Russia, but Crimea is certainly Putin's Jerusalem, because that is the thing that has given him the legitimacy that all bad things that he's done, at least he can say, I got us back Crimea. What Khrushchev gave up, I was able to take back. Mm -hmm. So now, obviously the thing that compels us to get together today is that there was a huge airstrike or special operations force or some sort of ballistic missile attack, some number of things that we'll talk about in just a second. But this is essentially not the culmination, but in fact, perhaps what we can call the biggest thing that we've been, biggest operation that we've been able to see the Ukrainians do. The first thing I want to do is as we get going, I'm just going to like literally point to things and then say, you know, just for everyone's, just for the viewer's orientation, this is Odessa. Over there is Kiev. Over there is Dnipro. Over there is, so in a larger sense, what we wanted to turn to when thinking about the map here is, first of all, you know, let's orient ourselves, you know, for the viewers. So basically, my finger right now is over Kherson. So if we look west, this is going to be Odessa. If we have sort of north northwest, that's going to be Kiev over there. This direction is towards Donetsk. This direction is towards Crimea. And that direction is towards Rostov. So just to give the sense of what is, what are we looking at when we're looking at Southern Ukraine? When we're thinking about where we are in the conflict right now, and we are roughly um, maybe 170 days into a three day war, uh, just for also like the time scale. And we're now in what could be called, let's say the third phase of the war. The first phase of the war was uh, Russia's shock and awe in order to bomb all parts of the country, create regime change in Kyiv, accept basically new government there, and then accept basically surrenders over the rest of the country for you know the following couple of weeks. That did not work out. Russia then reorganized itself and said that its actual um, intentions for this war were to take all of Donetsk and Luhansk provinces. Now they have taken all of the Luhansk province more or less, and they've taken at this point perhaps 75 to 80% of Donetsk province. They're then, also in the beginning phases of this war, they were also able to capture without much fighting Kherson Oblast, mm-hmm. Kherson region, as well as the the other parts of Zaporozhye, um, and in order to uh, menace Nikolaev. And these are the areas that are west of the Dnieper River, and that these are the areas that in effect are Im- important for a number of reasons. One, they control the mouth of Ukraine's major river. Two, they protect um, Odessa, which is Ukraine's major city of the south. And obviously the Russian intent is the more territory that they can take going westwards, the more pressure they can put on Ukraine's access to the sea and ostensibly link up with Transnistria and do all sorts of bad things to the people of the region. So that's all well and good. So where we have right now is the first phase, shock and awe, did not work. Second phase, take over all of Donbass. They've been able to do a lot of that but not all of that, Mm -hmm. but at huge uh, cost in terms of just human life, both to uh, civilians on the ground there, as well as to Russian forces. And we had um, the, I think it's the Undersecretary of Defense, Colin Call, the other day said that um, according to DOD data, and you know, whether one believes it or not, but they've been fairly accurate over the course of this entire conflict, is that they have uh, 
tracked about 80,000 Russian casualties. Yeah. That would be killed and wounded. So depending on you know what ratio of, of killed to wounded that we can see, there could be something like 15 to 20,000 Russian soldiers who have lost their lives in the special military operation, uh, you know, again, that had only been intended to last three days. So at huge cost, Russia is moving very, very slowly. And I saw someone on Twitter the other day um, calculate that uh, with only 4 million more casualties and a couple more years, they'll be able to make it to the other side of Europe. Um, and, you know, to really bring together a common European space from Lisbon to Vladivostok. So all that said, the Ukrainians have a vote in what they're going to do about this. Mm -hmm. So they had um, slowed the Russian advances to quite a bit, but were losing ground until the introduction of the HIMARS uh, missile system. Multiple launched rocket system, um, and HIMARS stands for... It's High Mobility Artillery right. Rocket System. Um, for those non-DOD listeners and viewers, we want to basically have an acronym-free universe here uh, so that you can get stuck into it. And, and what this has done is this changed a lot of what the Ukrainians were able to do. Because what they were able to do is instead of fighting the Russians in terms of force on force, which is something the Russians have an advantage in because they have so much more artillery, they have a real fire's advantage, is that they were able to stretch Russian supply lines by hitting things like ammunition depots, fuel supplies, yeah. uh, command and control, uh, reinforcements further and further away from the, the front lines. Stretching what the Russians were able to do, not so much to fight the Russians, uh, you know, force on force contact, but to inhibit the way the Russians do wish to fight. And so in that regard, the HIMAR system had allowed the Ukrainians to slow the Russians down to such an extent that what the Ukrainians said starting a couple of weeks ago is that they were going to obviously retake their territory, retake their land, and they were going to do that through a counteroffensive beginning in the south of Russia. So you, Ukraine. South, south of Ukraine. south of uh, Ukraine. Um, yeah, that's a that's an unfortunate uh, verbal uh, mistake. Um, because obviously what the Ukrainians are saying is not that they want to attack Russia, but that they want to take the Russian invaders off their land. And so here what we see yellow, these are the Ukrainian forces, and red, these are the Russian forces. And again, for um, orientation, this is the Dnieper River. So what we can see here is that on the west side of the Dnieper River, uh, what's coming called uh, right bank, you know, if you're looking south from Kiev downwards, is that there are all these Russian soldiers, all these Russian units in the in Kherson Oblast um, who have control of the city of Kherson um, and have their units all across this region. The Ukrainians are trying to get them, obviously, to leave. The, for the Russians, this is a major victory of the war so far because they were able to take it, uh, Kherson, without too much fighting at the beginning. And yeah. Related to that, um, President Zelensky of Ukraine uh, fired his prosecutor general and fired his domestic intelligence chief. His domestic intelligence chief was also one of his childhood friends and one of his business partners. So for basically the failing on the job of failing to accurately know defend or the, know or defend that to, area. Know, to know or defend and to understand that likely Kherson was riddled with um, turncoats for the for the Russian side, um, he fired one of his best friends. So in that regard, cleaning up shop in order to do something about it. So what we've seen is that one of the things that the Ukrainians have done is they've not tried to fight the the Russians. They haven't tried to fight them to a large extent, you know, force on force conflict. They haven't tried to invade the city of Kherson, but they have used this um, HIMARS system in order to go after the logistics supplying Kherson. And the result, as we've seen from, you know, eyewitness accounts, um, you know, in Russian social media, is that Russian soldiers are telling their friends, family, colleagues back home, both on social media as well as in uh, captured. Uh, telephone conversations is that they're saying all the locals hate us. They tell the Ukrainian military uh, all our locations. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, um, you know, kill us everywhere we go. And so in that regard, part of the Russian calculation is that there is a lot of resistance partisan activity in the city itself. And what the Ukrainians are doing 
is they're starting to bomb all of the bridges that go between Kherson Oblast on one side of the Dnieper River to the other. And this is meant in effect to one, make supply of the existing units in Kherson uh, that much more difficult, but two, also to corrode the morale of the Russian soldiers who are in Kherson. Because if the bombs are coming, if the missile attacks are coming, if the rocket attacks are coming, and there is no mechanism to escape easily, then it has the sensation in the Russian troops that they are going to be surrounded. And yeah. so that when basically the fires start to get hotter and hotter, where are they going to go? So we've seen in the last couple of weeks, the sort of, it's, it's hard to see here, but this is the Antonovka bridge um, that has been bombed and rendered not unusable in terms of, let's say foot traffic or very light civilian traffic, but military traffic is no longer possible over this bridge. Yeah. So like your heavier weapons, lots of supplies, that kind of thing just got a whole lot harder. And so what the Russians have tried to do is create, um, you know, these pontoon bridges and just have ferries going back and forth. And that is probably not going to be sufficient in the long term. Additionally, over the last couple of days, this is Nova uh, Kakovka. And so trying to find the, the exact, and this bridge right here, this bridge has also been attacked and has not been rendered totally unusable, but probably after the next missile salvo, it will. Mm -hmm. So again, all of these troops are probably feeling a bit more nervous. Nevertheless, we move south. And in moving south, we had over, uh, I guess it was two days ago by the time that we're recording this, is a very large attack on one of Russia's main Air Force bases on the uh, peninsula of Crimea. So we are here, this is the town of Yevtaporia. And what we have right here, this is the Saki Air Force Base. And at the Saki Air Force Base, and let me just move everything back, um, what, what did we see? What have we been able to observe over the last two days? Yeah, so the, the, uh, the first things that, that I think we all saw were actually um, tourist videos because um, I think we thought you mentioned, or maybe we didn't mention it, but after 2014, when the Russians took over Crimea, it became kind of tourist draw. And, you know, I think back to what you talked about naturally, like this, it's now back to Russia the way it should be. Let's go visit, right? Yeah. Um, tourists, as well as all the military forces that are there now, you know, we take our families with us, you know, not to war zones, but when we move, right? So, yeah. you know, Russian forces have moved in there and they took their families with us. But the point is there's this beach line here is it's tourist area, it's beach season and it's summertime, right? right? So the initial videos and reporting that we saw were um, from a distance, but still quite spectacular, um, sort of from the shoreline here, but initially very large fireballs, very large explosions um, from the Saki Air Base. And then uh, we started getting them from sort of multiple angles showing that there was definitely multiple distinct and it looked like simultaneous explosions going mm -hmm. off there. Uh, just a reporting Russians said everything from like, a you know, there was an accident. And I think the Ukrainian defense ministry said, careful where you throw your cigarette. Yes. Um, but as more video and pictures have come out, it looks like there's been significant damage to, uh, to parts of the base as well as the immediate surrounding area. So some of the things that I know, I know that I've seen have been some video and footage of destroyed aircraft on the ground mm -hmm. of farther away from the air, you know, the runways and where the, the revetments and the, you know, the parking aprons for the aircraft damage to buildings, damage to vehicles, civilian vehicles that are there. And then I think there's been a, a limited amount of sort of commercial satellite imagery top down showing destroyed things on the ground. In fact, I think you were just showing me just now mm -hmm. black and white footage of uh, destroyed hangars um, on either end of the aprons where the aircraft park and what definitely look like destroyed aircraft on the runway itself. And I think the initial casualties report went from one person killed to several and several wounded to um, dozens possibly killed right. and over a hundred wounded, which um, would indicate a extremely successful and catastrophic and highly damaging attack on this airbase. And when we think about the role of this particular airbase, and one of the little factoids that I learned recently is that this was in fact the airfield that uh, welcomed in, that brought in um, 
Winston Churchill and FDR, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, for the Yalta talks in the in the late 1940s during World War II. And in a larger sense, this has always been a very pleasant area. The the Black Sea is lovely if uh, if you ever get to visit. Yeah, well, well, someday, maybe. Someday. Um, <laughs> So what we have here is that it's military use right now is that this has been the air base that the Ukrainian military has said, this is the one that has been launching um, all those um, airstrikes, missile attacks, um, both against civilian and military targets in southern Ukraine. So when whenever we see those, you know, those cruise missiles that go into a hospital yeah. or they go into a port, it comes from this area. So this is a really high value military target um, and that it has been the thing that has been menacing the Ukrainian soldiers as well as Ukrainian civilians in the south of the country. So the military <clears throat> intention of it is to limit what the Russian Air Force can do to support the Russian soldiers in the field. So when we then bring it back to the larger context of Ukraine's counteroffensive, Russia's ability to blunt that counteroffensive has now been um, it's, I mean, it's reduced. Been reduced. Um, and I think we're still, uh, I haven't looked in the last few hours on possibly updated damage, but you know, you and I have looked at some old, admittedly old, you know, Google Earth imagery, and I've seen some, again, some of that commercial satellite stuff that's a little bit more recent, but um, you, you can fit a fair number of aircraft in there between the revetments and the parking aprons. Um, I've seen numbers from around 36 or so. I don't want to get too far into the numbers because I'll fully admit I don't know, but you can house a, and park a fair number of aircraft there. So if even half or two thirds of those were sort of parked and aligned as depicted, that's a big air power loss in just a few seconds of the attack that happened, which I would imagine given that Russia has already suffered so many material losses. They they cannot afford to lose two to three dozen aircraft in one fell swoop. Because they're they're not making new ones, no. uh, and they're not making them quickly. And so I think you know we'll maybe like splice in some of the footage of the or you know pictures of the of the damage. But we wanted to also take a moment, and admittedly, this is not exactly wild speculation, but it's like wild ish speculation. It is, it is speculation. Based on the laws of physics and, yeah. and you know reality as we know it, um, but I, I think the point is going back to the map yeah. here as you laid out the close you know the close fight here between the Russian and Ukrainian forces. This is not close. Right. This is this is quite far away, and um, I don't know if those folks watching on the YouTube version can see, but as a war game map, this is broken down into geographic hexes, and we have larger uh, yellow ones here, smaller red ones here. But each of the smaller red ones, this is 20 kilometers. Each of these large ones here is 100 kilometers across. So, you know, doing some rough math, that's a potentially good two to 300 kilometers right. away from where, you know, the front line is between Russian and Ukrainian troops. And why we're getting into speculation here is that um, that is not something that the HIMARS, no matter how successful they've been, can range. Right. HIMARS are a shorter range between 80 to 100 kilometers. Um, so, you know, they can range definitely one of these yellow squares, but that's not something that can affect all the way down here from where we know Ukrainian positions are. So where we're gonna get into some possible theories of what did cause this attack is what we're gonna lay into here. And so some of the competing theories are either this is a longer range missile strike, precision missile strike, some sort of um, cruise missile, or missiles, since they were simultaneous explosions. And or, for non-military audience, what defines a cruise missile? So we're getting getting into some uh, um, some physics here. I hate doing this because I'm a history major. Physics is not my thing. But talking about a cruise missile versus a ballistic missile, um, we're talking about roughly the the path that they fly to get to the target. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we talk about a cruise missile. I think most audience members are probably familiar with the Tomahawk cruise missile, right? We've all seen it with its little stubby wing sticking out and it sort of, you know, kind of flies along. But the point is, it's literally cruising. It's a, it's, it, it, for lack of a better term, it's cruising like an airplane at a, at a straight and level altitude. 
You can program in depending on the how good its guidance systems are. You can program in um, different routes for for how you want it to get there, so that you can actually do what we would call like an offset strike. Like your missile doesn't just fly from point A to point B. If it's a more advanced cruise missile, you can give it a a big circular route, so it comes in from an angle that your your target might not expect it to, or from right. an angle where it's less well protected, uh, which is something the Tomahawk cruise missile can definitely do. Um, and another thing it does is that it can fly very low to the ground, so it's harder to intercept. So Going back to the, you know, the Tomahawk cruise missile guidance packages, the, you know, when they first came out back in the you know, 70s, 80s, end of the Cold War, the thing that made it so dangerous for the enemy was that not only can it cruise, it's got very long range, it has very precision guidance, but it had a special um, radar mapping guidance system that allowed it to fly basically very close to the Earth's contours so you can't shoot it down, or it's much, much harder to shoot down because right. it's flying... Um, a very, very low, low observable profile. So much harder to knock it down. Um, last thing I'll say about the cruise missile is, is that it is cruising. Most of these, except for your hypersonics these days, are subsonic missiles. So they're, which is why having it that low is so advantageous because slower makes it easier to target. But if you put it down real close to the train, that makes it harder to target. So Got it. that's my cruise missile. Ted talk. And what does the ballistic All missile right. do? So a ballistic missile is, uh, it almost goes back to uh, older days of artillery where you're lofting something real, real high in the air, and then it comes back down on what you would call a uh, ballistic trajectory. So it's it's like a parabola. It's a big arc going up. So it goes very, very high, tips back over, comes on back down. Like any weapon system, different advantages and disadvantages. Sure. Um, ballistic missile systems, because uh, they go so high up in the atmosphere, Depending on your air defenses, that can also be really, really hard to shoot down because depending on how high your missile goes, you can get into like lower orbit, you know, and that takes a very advanced defensive system to intercept something that's in lower orbit. And once you get that high, when you come back down, you go a lot faster. So that is also hard to target, uh, you know, with kind of a sidebar, but which is why you have the, you know, kind of the, the measure countermeasure between um, adversary nation ballistic missiles and you've if you've heard talking about the patriot missile system or you know the terminal high altitude uh high terminal high altitude air defense missile system mm -hmm. it takes a different type of defensive system to intercept a ballistic missile versus a cruise missile um also ballistic missiles can depending on the the propellant and the missile itself they can be very long range as well cruise missiles are long range ballistic missiles are long range each of them presents a different problem set to trying to defend against it um but Bottom line with all that is a cruise missile or a longer range ballistic missile would absolutely be capable of ranging from where we, you know, Ukrainian control territory into the airfield. And in that regard, what are, so we know that the HIMARS can't, can't get this far um, because they only have a range of, let's say, 70 plus kilometers. And we're looking here at maybe two to 300, depending on, you know, from which spot in Ukrainian held Ukrainian territory we're talking about. So what are the potential or what are the possible um, weapons that could have been used if it had been one of these missile attacks? So because we we have no video, we don't really have a lot of information to go off of. And the Ukrainian government is not saying, although they've, yeah. they've dropped little sprinkles, but whether that's accurate or deliberate disinformation, we don't know. But the point is, we know that, you, you know, Ukrainians have old um, Russian, uh, Russian model ballistic missile systems. Mm -hmm. um, We've also seen uh, them introducing longer range precision missile systems like the Neptune missile, which is, a, you know, it's a homegrown, it's an anti-ship missile. Um, but nobody was really sure if that thing was actually operational, sort of like the Death Star, right? That thing's operational. They found that out when the Moskva sank yeah. or sunk, right? Um, and there, there's been some, again, speculative discussion that I've seen in some forums, but potentially you could modify that type of missile to do a, not hit a ship, but hit a static ground target. Um, either way, your longer range, uh, especially your 21st century anti-ship cruise set missiles are longer range capable. So, and if, again, we're speculating, right? But um, if you were looking at something from the Odessa area, that's a fairly straight and unobstructed shot over water toward that air base. Right. If that if that was in fact a cruise missile attack, 
So we, so the Ukrainians have said that it was done by a device exclusively of Ukrainian manufacture, which may or may not be true. Um, we know that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has said that the longer range um, Attackums missile, which has a 300 kilometer range, has not been provided to the Ukrainians. So if it came from Ukraine, uh, it came from, uh, let's say, Odessa region, fairly straight shot as these things go. Yeah, if that's, you know, and again, not knowing about, I don't, I don't know the, the max effective potential range of the Neptune system. In fact, I think most ops don't know because we didn't think it was operational until the sure. war started. Um, but for a, for a cruise type missile or for a long range anti-ship missile in 21st century, yeah, that's a, that's, that's within range. Okay. So that's basically one potential scenario that it was some sort of cruise or ballistic missile. Um, it could have been, uh, perhaps a Neptune. It could have been perhaps, um, the Ukrainians have been working on a ballistic system called the, the Grom, you know, thunder, uh, missile system. Maybe that was it. We don't know. So all we know is that that is one potential scenario. Another potential scenario is that it was Ukrainian, uh, special, special operations forces. So special operators, how plausible do you think that is? So. Jayla's personal opinion here, and uh, I also note that we had Mr. Tim Barrick in here and we were sort of discussing theory. Um, Jayla's personal opinion is that that is extremely unlikely um, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, I, looking at the distances here, one, uh, you're probably not airdropping. So one thing I don't think we mentioned yet, but this was a daytime attack, mm -hmm. broad daylight, tourists are on the beach, they're all swimming. So how you get special forces in and out of places is a huge consideration for how you use them. I just don't see that happening daytime in theory anyway. Um, also, I don't think we have any indication the Ukrainians have the type of delivery systems that could get special forces that far um, to conduct this type of thing, getting there undetected, right? You know, some of your, there's, there's airborne delivery options. There are, you know, surface water delivery options. There are subsurface delivery options. I really don't think that's, that's on the table. Um, there, we were speculating back and forth, maybe could the, could special forces somehow have designated for another munition system, but that still leaves you the problem of getting them there and mm -hmm. then getting them back. Cause you probably want to, you would like to get them back if possible to use them again in the future. Cause if they're good enough to do this, they are definitely very high value individuals yes. that you would like uh, to have returned. So when we think about special operations, um, anything's possible under the sun, this is just really big, really complicated. So unlikely at best. Unlikely. And I, I think, in fact, this leads into our potential third theory speculation here, which is the size of the initial explosions that we saw. Now, you refer to yourself as J-Lo. So for the listeners and the viewers at home, uh, that is your call sign? Yes, I'm a call sign because I'm a pilot and we give each other silly names because that's just how we are. And so you're trained as a pilot. Um, now, as a pilot, what are the potential uh, pathways by which this could be done by some sort of aircraft? Yeah, so um, laying some groundwork here, um, back to the last thing I said, which was the size of the explosions. Um, this is something we were talking about as well earlier before we started recording was ranging for a cruise missile, a cruise missile or ballistic missile, absolutely on the table. Mm -hmm. But relatively speaking, the amount of explosives those things actually carry um, is somewhat limited because to get them that range, most of that missile body is fuel to get it so far. And, you know, like anything in aviation, as a pilot, there's a trade off more fuel is less stuff I can carry. So for the, like the big impact of your, your ballistic or your long range cruise missiles is they can go really far and they're very precise. So if you have a precise thing, you're trying to blow up, you don't need a huge amount of explosives. And then you can save whatever you didn't put for explosives to fuel to get it there. Right. Getting into the, again, the realm of speculation here, but uh, I'll also say I was a um, pilot, but I also did some time as a forward air controller, which for those on, on the, uh, the mic here who are not familiar, forward air controller is a person on the ground who is actually talking to aircraft up in the air um, and guiding them in to conduct different types of missions on the ground. And um, in the Marine Corps, there are uh, a forward air, we have, a, there's a couple of different things. And in the joint force, there's something called a joint terminal attack controller which gets largely the same training and conducts the same missions as your forward air controller. 
But the forward air controller is a little bit special because that's actually an aviator. That is a pilot who has gone away from the aircraft and is assigned to a ground unit to, uh, to do that conduct of fires, um, to help with aviation mission planning for the ground unit. Um, but what we can also do, what I like to say is like, we can translate pilot talk, mm -hmm. right? So um, anyone who's talked to an aviator knows, like you talk to military people, you've all, I'm sure you're like, they speak an alien language, right? Aviators have their own special like sub language. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it doesn't always make sense to those who are not, not in that community to include, you know, folks on the ground. The forward air controller acts as, as a as a translator essentially. So, you know, the ground combat commander who they're attached to says, "I want to I want helicopters to move me from here to here, and I want jets to drop bombs here." Um, that's my plan. Um, the forward air controller, or the um, if there's many and it's multiple ones in the unit, the senior one is usually what we call an air officer, who is like the senior senior aviation advisor to the commander. Um, but they get the same training as the, the forward air controllers. There's it's a more, um, it's a higher level planning role. Point is they will take the, the ground commander's plan, translate it into aviation speak for how aviators do their mission planning. Um, there'll be a linkage between the two units to go and conduct it. And um, when it comes time to actually do the missions, it'll be that forward air controller on the radio, talking to the pilots in their own language for what they need them to do. Um, especially important if the plan is modified uh, so you can quickly express changes to the plane in the language that the aviators understand so that they can do it as quickly as possible. Right. Um, where is I going with that? Point is, uh, I, I'm, a, so I'm a helicopter pilot that usually carries people and stuff, but that time as a forward air controller, I saw things go boom. So when I talked about how looking at the video, that was a lot of stuff going boom, which is, again, going back to JLo's personal theory, um, special operators are not going to be carrying that much stuff to be able to... Uh, to do that amount of damage and because the the amount of so the, the size of the bombs we don't know but they could be a thousand pounds two thousand yeah, pounds to to my my admittedly you know data time as a forward air controller it's been several years so i won't say how many um but those were those were big um pieces of explosives that went off and not necessarily something it's not something you can put on a ballistic or cruise missile but that's absolutely something you can hang on an aircraft so, okay. Um, so, so take us through, we can see here, this is the air base. This is basically like a tourist, you know, beach area. Here's like a fairly major town for the area. Again, what do you see here? And what have you seen in terms of the evidence that we've seen from videos, pictures, uh, eyewitness accounts, how might this have happened? So first thing I'm going to do is, um, again, courtesy of Mr. Tim Barrick, who's been using the uh, um, the online source, Germany in the West, who's been providing updates of troop lay down positions basically since the start of the war. Um, and it's, it's a fairly good level of detail, although we admit that you know, like where specific battalions are, don't know yet, but, sure. but he has a pretty good general picture of it. So we're looking down here at, so Saki airfield would be right about here. Got the whole country of Ukraine here. We have seen that the Ukrainian Air Force is, is intact and conducting missions. Um, because we have we have the video and the, the battle damage assessment that they are very much active causing damage. And part of why they've been able to do that is that in Western Ukraine, you can see there are a number of airfields. Those are these, if we can see it on the video, um, the orange markers here. So Western Ukraine um, has acted as somewhat of a safe haven for a number of things. It's allowed, uh, it's allowed the Ukrainian Air Force to stay constituted, to have safe places they can return to that are not in immediate danger of Russian aviation sorties. Uh, we know that that's supply lines coming in there. That, you know, that's how um, all the NATO, US, everybody pumping weapons in, um, coming in through uh, ground ports of entry in the Western part of the country. Um, and also where, you know, the Ukrainian military that's not in direct contact with the Russian forces, that's where they're able to like regroup, retrain, um, you know, learn some of these new weapon systems. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an area that Russia has only sort of sporadically affected with long range missile strikes, I think is, I'm not sure if they've even tried aviation here. I don't think they have. It's mostly been long range cruise missile type strikes because that's right. the only thing that has the range. So um, again, we're going into the, the realm of speculation, but I, you know, as we were talking, I did put on my, my aviator hat and my board air controller hat. And um, if this, if based on the size of the explosions, if this was in fact 
aviation delivered ordnance because because attack aircraft can absolutely carry 1,000 to 2,000 pound bombs, and that is that is no fuel. That is all bomb. Okay. That is that is everything everything that's in there. That's not the casing of the bomb. Is there to to raise hate and discontent? So that that is, that is the most violent version of all hat no cattle we're going to get today. Yes. Um, so you get you get in 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 the same sort of three dimensional package that has all explosives that that right. does tremendous damage. Now you have to get it there, which is where if um, if this were an airstrike, um, again from my own aviation planning side. I think there's a way you could do that potentially. Um, it Walk was through it. Yeah, it would it would be high risk because as we said, it's daytime, which um, is so much easier to be found if you're flying around in the daytime than the nighttime. Um, based on where sort of the the safe areas are in Ukraine, it's going to be a longer range flight. And if you're flying daytime, um, you're what we do what we would call terrain flight or nap of the earth flight um, or or low altitude flight, depending on which airframe you're flying. But the point is, you're flying as close to the ground as humanly possible, because that makes it a lot harder for enemy air defense systems and enemy aircraft to find you. And if they find you, it's still hard to target you, because um, a lot of um, anti-aircraft systems require a contrast between the aircraft and the background. When you're down in the terrain, you're just, you're there, there's ground, there's trees, there's mountains, there's hills and stuff. There's what we call like background clutter which makes it a lot harder for even really good anti-aircraft systems to acquire you, even if they see you. Okay. So, however, um, if you're launching from your safer areas, uh, you're gonna need gas, right? Which means um, some sort of way to extend what your aircraft can carry. However, uh, we were talking about though, we've seen images of Ukrainian fighters and ground attack aircraft with what we would call drop tanks or external tanks, which is basically bolting on another fuel tank to the aircraft to extend its range. So. Okay. All that said, depending on where they take off from, they might be pushing the limits of uh, even with their external fuel, what they can carry. And when they're when you're flying low into the train, you're burning more gas anyway because the air is denser, so it's harder for the aircraft to move through it. Um, when you're deep in the train, uh, you have to do a lot of little sort of small micro maneuvers to avoid running into things like trees, power lines. Mm -hmm. So all that is consuming more gas. But the point is. It might be at the limits of a uh, of a ground attack aircraft's range, but it's it's feasible, um, de especially depending on where they started. If they started, say, at an airfield closer to the front line here, that's uh, and I'll it's not on the map here, so I'll just point here. But that's a much shorter distance than if you're starting way up here. And also, if you're flying closer, you get the benefit of because you don't need as much fuel, you can carry bigger bombs. All right, so we zoomed out a little bit. Um, but to, if you were to set up this attack, we talked about the friendly, you know, the friendly Western part of the country. And as you can see from the troop laydowns here, there's a corridor going out into, um, into the black sea that is far, relatively far away from Russian ground forces, uh, depending on what the Russian Navy is doing at any given time or, uh, what ground-based air defenses Russia has put on. You know the shoreline here on the western part of Crimea and the, the the southwestern coast of Ukraine. It's not necessarily a a corridor without danger, um, but since you sort of control both sides here, that's a corridor that makes it a lot harder for enemy forces to find you. Um, and if they try and find you, they're probably gonna have to fight their way through some of your own air defenses there. So that's not an easy thing. And then once you get out over the ocean, again, depending on what the Russian fleet is doing, it's not without danger, but an aircraft flying extremely low to the ground, that is not an optimal place for ship-based air defenses to acquire you. Ship-based air defenses, radars, um, things like that, they're good when they're looking up into clear open sky with like lots of line of sight, right? Big open sky, radar ping returns, um, that's what they're designed for. They're not designed for picking up things real down low in the ground here. Um, and for a human with a pair of binoculars, you're moving too fast. Yeah, you're moving too fast and be getting into the physics again here. If you're flying really close, you now have the curvature of the earth to help you out too. So even if you do have Russian ships floating around here, again, we talked about 20 kilometer hexes, 100 kilometer square area here. You have where your eyes can see to the curvature of the earth of the horizon right. to pick up something with binoculars. And I don't know off the top of my head what the range of eyeballs to, the, to a flat horizon is but it's not a hundred kilometers. 
right? Maybe, maybe you, you get a, maybe you get a hex or two there, depending on on where you are and if you're on the bridge versus on the deck. Point is, it's a lot harder. Um, now there are airborne radars that are called look down, shoot down, that are specially designed to pick up aircraft that are flying low in the ground terrain. Um, those are fairly advanced systems. We know the Russians have them, but the question is, you know, for those things to work, um, you need to have aircraft in the air. We have no idea what the Russian sort of combat air patrol situation is on any given day here. Um, two, you need a, you need to know where to look. So if you have a, and you don't need to know where to look and you need to radiate, you need to actually release radiation from your radar to find that thing on the ground. So. If there's no combat air patrol, there's no radar, there's no way to look. Even if there is a combat air patrol, if they don't know to look, if there have been no early warnings that there's some sort of strike package coming in through here, they're just going on their merry way. And if you're flying, you know, 20,000 feet up here, you are not going to see a tiny little jet making its way down on the surface. So your... basically, you're just going right past the beat cops. Yeah, um, unless, and unless they're looking for you. Now, if they're looking for you, um, that is more dangerous, but they need to know where to look. And ocean is a big place. Um, and unless they got good, um, uh, sort of a good vector from whatever their early warning system is, even if somebody said, hey, there's a couple of planes coming, you know, depending on where you are, you don't know how they're gonna maneuver. That's still a pretty large area to try and cover. It, it, it's almost like the needle in the haystack, right? Okay. Um, and that's just doing it visually. Now you turn your radar on, that makes it a lot easier because radars, um, they are designed to find very small things in a very large wide area. They're not gonna fly around with the radars on though because um, the second you do that, every enemy radar receiving system will see that there's a radar there. You've just highlighted your own location mm -hmm. to any enemy air, air defense, enemy air patrol um, that might uh, have a radar receiver on it. So that's for your average combat air patrol, it's, it's generally not done because mm -hmm. you would be skylining your own position, which is really bad in this kind of war. Um, Got it. So the point is there are, it's not without danger, but there's a pretty good corridor uh, to send an aircraft package in here, nap of the earth and have it get in without being detected. All right, so we've sort of, we've, uh, we've flown our corridor um, here and now we're in the outer environs of the Saki area. And uh, again, this is speculation, but if you were to look for a the least hazardous way in and way out, you have options in this train. If I'm uh, if I'm a little Ukrainian Su-24, um, the way one would approach this this kind of zone is you're flying nap the earth. You can you can do that. You can navigate if you have good inertial navigation system or or a GPS system. But in these days. Most aircraft have that. Me as a pilot, that's probably my primary navigation, especially if I'm flying over flat, featureless water. Um, that might be my my best way to get there. However, when I'm over, you know, the objective area, which if uh, if if you're dropping bombs, it's a target area. If you're flying a helicopter, drop troops. It's a landing landing zone. But what have you? But once I'm in the area where the thing's going to happen, I like to have visual cues that will funnel me basically to the thing that I'm trying to get to to make sure that I'm going to the right place. And as it happens, the area around Saki Air Base has some visual cues that are both things you can, they're big enough, you can pick them up. It's hard to mistake them for anything else. And there are also corridors for going in and out and minimizing the threat to your aircraft because you don't wanna get shot at on the way in. And ideally you don't wanna get shot at on the way out after you've done your mission. So there would be a way to do that. Um, and if, as we're looking here, the airfield is right here on the map. You have a bunch of lakes here along the coastline. And as you can see, there's a lot of farmland. There's some towns around here, but a lot of it is just open uh, open area. So if you were to plan a route going in, you have options uh, with visual cues and minimizing your exposure. So say you came in from the south, you've got a, a fairly good lake bite out here. And there's also a, uh, a town out here, something we would call a catching feature where if you hit the catching feature, you know, have gone too far. But you want to have like a, a good, again, good, big, visible feature to help cue you in so you don't go too far. As it happens, you've got a lake in a town. That's a pretty good set of features there. Um, if you were coming in from the south, you could potentially fly over that lake as your first checkpoint. You have a larger lake here as a second checkpoint to confirm that you're going the right way. And then you've got the airfield right in front of you. 
you could drop your ordinance. There is a, again, another non-built up quarter over here that takes you to another lake and another lake. So if you were to build this out, you potentially have a route of ingress and egress over very uh, clearly visible features uh, with a minimum exposure to enemy ground-based air threats. And um, both of these, depending, you know, you can go that way or go that way, but both of them are also easy to get back out over that open water, which is your best friend. Because once you, once you get out over there, you're now again in this just, you know, big wide area that you're back in the needle in the haystack. So I could see how you could plan, um, you could plan this type of thing using those things I talked about um, to do a strike on that field. If you, you have uh, jets with extended tanks, you can make that range. Um, and the jets would be the thing capable of carrying large amounts of ordnance to cause large explosions we saw. Um, and we saw them as simultaneous explosions too. So aircraft can do that. You drop either uh, you have two aircraft, two distinct targets, they drop at the same time. You have two simultaneous fireballs. Um, now the one, you know, again, this is all speculation and, you know, something else that uh, makes it hard to wonder if, uh, you know, if, if an airstrike would be the thing they do as you talk about it's daytime. That is a gutsy mission to do mm -hmm. in the daytime. Um, are Ukrainian pilots capable of doing low level flights to hit precision targets? We, yes, we saw that. We got the video on Snake Island. They can absolutely do that. That was at nighttime. Um, doing things in daytime, it's a, it's a different ballpark just because it's so much easier for any anything with a pair of eyeballs on the ground, much mm -hmm. easier to pick you up in daytime as a, as a moving spec, whereas nighttime, you're just a sound out there somewhere potentially. So gutsy, gutsy move. Um, but is it feasible? Sure, it's feasible. Have they just demonstrated the tactical ability to do that in the past? Yes, we have. We definitely have evidence of it. Um, but, you know, but we don't know because we don't have any from all those tourist videos. We saw lots. We saw the explosions, but we haven't seen anything yet. You know, we haven't seen little specks zooming along, which is why this is speculation. Um, but I'm kind of I'm, I'm done my my aviation planning TED talk okay. to you now as well. Um, but, you know, the point is, this is a uh, it's an unusual attack based on on sort of the day to day conflict that we've seen. It's not within the range of the weapon systems that we know we've given them. Um, it's extremely audacious. Um, but it, you know, but it does suggest that, again, sort of new phase of the war um, and potentially also suggests the. Ukrainian risk assessment of how effective they think Russian countermeasures are going to be. Um, because whether it was a cruise missile or aviation, um, it's still very long range. And a long, the longer the range is, like, the, hard, the easier it is for the enemy to do something to you. Um, so it's by no means like a sure thing over this kind of range, even if you have precision missiles or if you got really, really good air crew. The farther the distance, the more the risk is going to be that something bad could happen in the mission. Um, so it suggests that the risk assessment of either Russian anti-missile defenses or Russian anti-aircraft defenses, that there was very low capability over here, that this strike had a good chance of doing it um, successfully. And we talked a little bit about the information side on this as right. well, but doing it daytime is, for aviation, that's, that's much more risky. However, we've seen the videos, and that's kind of the point. They did right. this where everybody, every little tourist, every Russian swimmer and Russian military family member on the beach, they saw it. They could not ignore it. It was basically in their faces because this was nice sunny day, like you said, on the coast of the Black Sea. And again, on speculation here, but if uh, if they if the Ukrainians felt that there was a higher chance of failure for this mission, maybe still do it if you have the the stuff to do it with. But maybe you do it at nighttime. So if something goes wrong, it's not quite as visible. Uh, the fact they did it in daytime, again, I'm speculating, but to me, just watching what they've done on sort of on the information space suggested they had a very high confidence that mm -hmm. this was going to work. So they planned it in the daytime, which to me says their their assessment of Russian capability, competence in this area was extremely low. And preparedness. And preparedness, yeah. That at minimum, the vigilance was very low. Yeah. Um, you know, and so when you talked about the information, the, the images that came basically from 
uh, from Crimea over the course of like the last two days is a, a traffic jam. So from, you know, the site of attack here, there is one big bridge right here that's been built at tremendous cost of the Russian Federation into actual Russia. And so where the, and so the images that we've seen is all the tourists who are just enjoying, you know, cause they're not going abroad, <laughs> roughly speaking anymore, having their nice August holidays, uh, a total sense of this is our area, this is our calm, um, nothing is going to happen to us here because the Ukrainians, whatever they're doing in terms of special military operation, Crimea is Russia. Crimea has the Russian nuclear guarantee. So you have a lot of people who are fundamentally shocked and shaken to their core. And so I've, I watched a lot of videos and saw pictures of basically this 100 kilometer um, uh, traffic jam at the, on the Kerch Bridge. A uh, lot of people in tears because they simply didn't think this is something that could happen to them. And so for obviously the Ukrainians, this is tremendous catharsis. Everything that they've experienced in terms of their own, uh, you know, their own hospitals, their own apartment buildings being bombed, simply put the the Russians here, you know, around Yevtaporia, Nova Fyodorovka, um, simply could not believe that the military base, which had been menacing Ukraine, Ukrainian forces, could simply be attacked. So there's a shock, and this goes into what is the information component of the the two sides. For the Russians, their strategy over the rest of this war is very clear. Use violence to keep the war going, you know, obviously try to conquer as much as possible, but really in order to create war fatigue in Europe and in the United States. To get the idea out there, to empower those voices who say, Ukraine's going to lose eventually anyways, so why are we experiencing gas shortages, yeah. inflation, um, basically lost economic opportunities, why don't we just basically bring this to an end, have the two sides come together, they make peace, we can all go on with our lives. The Russians understand that, in essence, the Ukrainians are doing very well in the battlefield, but the reason the Ukrainians are doing well is because of the support from the West. So they can't honestly do very much about the battlefield, but they can try to work the political angle. And obviously for the Ukrainians, they want to make sure that they can demonstrate to the world writ large, as well as to their own population, we are taking back our territory. We have the momentum on our side. So for the Russian population, for the last six or so months of the war, they've been able to ignore as much of it as they want. The economy is not doing well. You know what? You can find a million reasons to explain why that's the case. But this is something in which it's not Donetsk, it's not Luhansk, it is quote unquote Russia itself. So one of the things that you know you can infer from like what the Russians find to be truly a threat is what they don't show on their evening news, what they don't cover in their um their political talk shows. Uh -huh. So do you want to guess what the lead story was on last night's um like main political talk show hosted by um uh this guy Solovyov? Uh, let's see here. What would be the most pressing issue in Russia on the day that, by law, Russian territory was attacked in daylight? You know, seemingly a kilometer and a half around the air base, huge amounts of their air assets in, in, uh, on Crimea that's menacing Ukrainian forces, that's helping the special military operation. You know, because it was daytime, it probably took out a command and control center because obviously people are at work during the day. All of this is happening. The uh, Crimean governor declares a state of emergency on the peninsula um, and raises the, the terrorist threat level to its highest um, for the rest for basically the next couple of weeks. What do you think they went with first on the news? I'm going to I'm going to roll the dice and say it was 50 50 something an American politician said. Or tweeted, or I don't know, local sports team, gay sports team. You would be correct with the first one. They led with the FBI raid on Donald Trump. While their airfield was burning. While their territory was attacked, the the experiences of the former president was the thing that they were going for. And so when we see that, 
what we can infer, because we see it at a number of other crisis moments, is that Putin hasn't made a decision on what to do, so they have to vamp for time. Mm -hmm. This is the, the next act isn't ready, so they're just doing soft shoot on the stage until until the next act, uh, you know, can get the bird in the cage or whatever it is that they're going to do. So when we put it all together, like from start to finish, in the third phase of this war, the first phase ended in the Russian inability to uh, fulfill its war aims. In the second, they were able to fulfill most, but not all of their war aims, but a tremendous human cost. And in the third phase of the war, what we see is the Ukrainians taking the counter offensive. Part of the counteroffensive is that the introduction of HIMARS systems, as well as potential other systems, as well as just audacious, as you put it, um, potential airstrikes, is that they are increasing the supply chains, increasing the logistical uh, difficulties experienced by the Russian armed forces to get supplies to the front, but also bringing the front much closer to Russian civilians. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, we can see that this is the thing that Putin did not want. He wanted the fighting to be in Ukraine and not in Russia. He wanted the people of Europe to put pressure on their political class to stop helping Ukraine. And then when we turn it around, what the Ukrainians wanted to show their own people is that they were doing something, that they were taking the initiative. And that what they want to do in terms of events such as this one, you know, sinking the Moskva, the Black Sea Fleet's flagship, retaking Snake Island is to give credence to their argument that with more external assistance, they will liberate their own country. That the amount of stuff and the quality of the stuff that's given to them is going to be very well used. And that's going to be the information battle over the next couple of weeks, and particularly as basically Ukrainian forces push the front line back and back. Um, or you guys, you know, forward, forward from their perspective. Yeah. Um, I said back because I'm literally uh, standing behind Russian front lines at this point. Yeah, no, I understand. And the, uh, the way the camera is angled, I feel like I'm in the, uh, in the call of the vomit comet where they tried to induce vertigo on even flight training, but that's a separate story. Um, yeah, no, I think the, the information piece is, uh, the point you brought up about what the lead story was, you know, something that that Putin, the Putin government has been able to do somewhat successfully is keeping that external information from resonating or from even making it to the larger population. And yeah, the major talk show was able to do it, right? But more things like this, it's going to be harder and harder to explain. Well, why why does the entire population of Crimea now back in like a Moscow suburb, right? Like, why what made them leave? Kind of yeah. thing, and it there's still I'm sure ways to control that information flow, but it gets harder when you have something like a what this literally is, as you pointed out, this is a mass population displacement now, right? In the wrong direction from the Russian perspective, right? How do you explain that? And that you know, so that's something we'll track, you know, for the next episode is as these people come back having cut their vacations short because of threat of violence. What does that do in uh, to the not the political position of Putin? Like that's pretty strong, but how do they ex how do the Russians explain the growing audacity of the Ukrainians? Yeah, it's going to be hard. And uh, I'll, I'll throw in one last point, and then we've we've been we wanted to do a short one, and we're well past that now. But okay, um, one last thing is uh, I some other folks had noted um, that you know with now at least a a demonstrate the capability in one case of these longer range strikes capable of reaching, you know, much farther south on the Crimean Peninsula. Well, that airfield's gone now, right? You still have um, Russian Black Sea Fleet, the ones that are not on the bottom of the Black Sea right now. Um, this this now creates a whole new conundrum for them down in Sevastopol, where maybe they thought they were safe um, tied up there. They don't seem to be safe anymore. Um, or at least they can't assume that they're that this is a safe haven for them anymore. Um, and I think, you know, that that like any like any good. Offensive uh, attack, you try and put your enemy in a conundrum and now the, you know, the Russians are going to have a conundrum of do you keep the fleet in port and risk it getting blown up in the next strike? 
or did we sortie the fleet and expose it to the anti-ship missiles that we now know are operational that we right. have? And we can't send them away because the uh, the Turks have closed the straits, yeah. right? So what what looked like a, I think I mentioned like the poison pill of Crimea in the last episode, right? Uh, does, does this demonstrated capability, this long range strike capability now make what used to be like the springboard to get into Ukraine, a millstone that slowly drags down Russian operations here with not a lot of good options. Um, you send them away, where do they go? Right? And if you send them away to protect the fleet, you've now lost all the capability they have for conducting offensive operations against Ukraine. And there's yet another, there's yet another drawback, a difficult trade off is that if this fleet right here no longer feels safe and moves to, let's say, a port in Novorossiysk, which is in Russia proper. Mm -hmm. It thus indicates to the Ukrainians and the rest of the world that these ships are not safe, you know, docked by Crimea, but they are safe in Russia. And so therefore, Russia's claim that Crimea is, you know, in indisputably part of its territory. Where the you know and the Ukrainians say they're not going to attack Russian territory; they're only going to attack the occupied Ukrainian territory. Taking this to safety in Russia indicates that the sovereignty exercised by Russia on Crimea is that much weaker than it was before this strike. Mm -hmm. And so that is where the Ukrainians have said they're ultimately going to go: is that they're going to retake all of their own territory and not an inch more. Yeah, well, they've now demonstrated they can they can at least reach out and touch large swaths of that territory. And uh, if I were if I were a surviving Russian air base commander or a Russian ship commander tied up, I'd be uh, man. I'd make sure my fire watch was paying attention this time uh, rather than being at the beach. But all right, we've we've gone quite a long time now, okay. so I think uh, we'll we'll skip resetting up the other camera and just yeah. call it a day. But um, I keep saying we're going to cut it shorter, maybe in third time's a charm. But no, I think this is a good discussion to have because this was definitely a unusual development on the battlefield. And I think it was made clear, you know, the, the distance, among other things, is what has made it unusual and does indicate, as we talked about in the last episode, there's a new phase of the war unfolding. Yeah. And we're starting to see, like, the first, the first punch is landing in that phase of the war. All right. Well, I will let you get back, and uh, okay. hopefully, ninety-five is not too bad to you. But uh, it was great Ooh. to have you come in here in person and do this again. Thanks to Mr. Tim Barrick for letting us borrow his map. This has been a fantastic tool, and again, we'll note to the students and faculty at Marine Corps University, you know, this is a tool that's here for you. And this map is set up right next to the Crew Life Center on a permanent basis, and is going to be updated um, with real as near to sort of real-time knowledge as we know. For troop dispositions as the conflict continues. So please take advantage of it and take advantage of the knowledge that Mr. Bear brings to the center here, as well as the knowledge that you've all brings to the center. As well as the knowledge that JLo brings to the center. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's I don't know. I've, I've done a combined arms TED Talk and a aviation TED Talk now. I should probably stop doing TED Talks. People are tired of hearing from me. Well, great. Thank you again, you've all and thank thanks you. to our audience. And uh please uh keep watching us, following us on social media and um on our email distribution for future episodes. And we'll see you then. Thank you.